I'm live. Uh, my name is Luke Bins, and I'm hosting today's showcase for the Open Data Climate Action Challenge. Now, uh, my, I work as a projects coordinator and also a data coordinator for Smart Dublin. And Dublin is and Smart Dublin is an initiative of the four Dublin local authorities, and we work with. Um, all kinds of new technologies to improve local authority services and address city region challenges. And we're going to talk today about our challenge that we're addressing this time, which is the Climate Action Challenge, and we're doing this through use of our open data. So this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to have an intro to the challenge itself. Uh, we're going to move on to our keynote, who on our keynote speaker today is Professor John Sweeney. We're going to run through the seven participating projects which took part in the challenge. We're going to have a few words from our uh, Climate Action Regional Office, David Dodd, representative, and also from the National Open Data Programme, and uh, that's Helena Campbell. We're going to finish up then with the rewards for the three prize winning participants of the active uh, Climate Action Challenge. So moving on to the next slide. So I've talked a little bit about who we are and what we do, and that there is our open data platform, which is called Dublinked. You can access that at data.smartdublin.ie, and there we publish data from the four Dublin local authorities and also through some um, uh, partners, public sector partners, and all of which relates to the Dublin region. So we didn't organize uh, uh, this challenge uh, by ourselves. There was many different partners that came together to bring this challenge to you. We are involved in running the National Open Data Portal, uh, but we're not climate action experts. So we did get the climate action officers from the four Dublin local authorities together to do this. Um, also, we had input from Dublin Cairo, and they'll speak a little bit more about uh, what they do a bit later. Kodima, Dublin's energy agency, Dairy Links, who are open data specialists, and also uh, we got funding from the National Open Data Programme, and we had mentorship and assistance from all kinds of outside experts from uh, the Regional Waste Management Office to the National Biodiversity Data Centre to the Dublin Biosphere. So lots of hands on deck to get this challenge together and to bring these projects to you today. So the challenge process, basically what it was is it was a call to action to show us how you can use open data to drive climate action. We launched this in April and then we did a shortlisting process of the 
37 applications that came in. We got them down to seven participating projects, and then they were given two to three months of uh, to develop their projects, giving them advice and mentorship al along the way, and enabling a collaboration really between all the participating projects. And it was great to see them all working together and pushing each other on. So then we came to an evaluation of the seven participating projects at the end, and then we'll have three of those which will be awarded prize winners, and we'll get into those in a little while. So these are the participants. As I say, there's seven of them. There's the Go Zero Waste app. There's a nature based solutions. Zoning map. Uh, there's a Dublin cycling prioritization analysis tool which shows where the cycling infrastructure is and where it could or should be. An I adapt game which is all about adapting to climate change. An invasive species dashboard which shows us where native woodlands are and what invasive species might be threatening them. And a my Re remote working hub um, application which is a web app basically that shows you uh, where remote working hubs are and when they can or should be and finally the Dublin Carbon Calculator interactive infographics to show us where we're at in terms of our emissions and what are various different actions that we can take the effects that they would take on us getting us towards our climate change goals. So the format of the showcase today is, as I say, we have seven uh, participants presenting. They'll all pitch their solutions, the tools, applications and dashboards that they've developed through the challenge. And if you have any questions for any of them, you can put them into the Q&A function there. So you just click on uh, chat, um, uh, a window should appear, and then you can put the question there to whoever is presenting on that specific project. So before we move on to the showcase, as I say, we have a keynote. It's uh, being delivered by Emeritus Professor of Climatology, uh, John Sweeney. Uh, he's the review editor and author of the co-author of the fourth IPCC report, which won that organization a Nobel Peace Prize and also former president of Antarctica. So John, I'd like to hand over to you. Please take control of the slideshow and please take control of the meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Luke, uh, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Well, we've been besieged over the summer by scenes like this uh, on our television screens, uh, in our newspapers and various media, indicating the increasing scale and increasing hardship that's being caused by climate breakdown. And in terms of tackling that climate breakdown, which we've seen even as extending to our own backyard uh, this summer, uh, we obviously need uh, informed decisions to be made. And informed decisions really require the quality of data, the range of data, the temporal range of data necessary to enable us to make the right choices for the future. And I wanted to start by maybe showing you just a couple of examples where things have gone wrong when we haven't had open data, when we haven't used data properly. This is perhaps the, one of the better known ones, the Challenger disaster of 1986, when the cause of that disaster was simply the breakdown of rubber seals, which allowed gases to blow up the fuel tank. And we know that rubber becomes less pliable in colder temperatures. So the engineers looked at that data that was available where incidents had occurred in seven previous launches and they compared the incidents with the temperatures that existed at those launches. And you can see here that there were incidences ranging from temperature at launch of 53 degrees Fahrenheit to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And they concluded rather logically that there's no problem here. Uh, temperature is not going to be a difficulty for our uh, rubber ring seals. Now, of those seven launches, of course, uh, you were only looking at a small sample. And when you looked at the full data, the open data was made available. When you that then looked at all 24 launches, you can see down here that there were no problems occurring to any extent when the temperature was warm um, and only three out of 20 flights had any incidences. 
uh, of, of failure. But when you looked at the colder temperatures, um, including the seven, of course, that were looked at, uh, almost all of the flights had incidences involved. So you would conclude from looking at the full data here, as opposed to the partial data, you would make a very different conclusion. And of course, we know that the air temperature and the launch on that tragic day was only 36 degrees Fahrenheit. So it demonstrates the need for looking at the full range of data available and not jumping to conclusions based on a sample and based on a small element of that data. And of course, the other celebrated and not celebrated case is the discovery of the ozone hole, where very sophisticated instruments in Nimbus 4 simply failed to detect the ozone hole. It was a relatively simple instrument based on the surface by scientist Joe Farman, who didn't have access to that open data initially, and he was getting very different results at the surface. And it turned out, of course, that it was the data processing of that data, which was done in rather enclosed, I suppose, uh, security uh, sort of situations that showed that the computer had been programmed to reject data which showed uh, abnormally high or abnormally low levels of ozone. So again, it's an example of where access to data, in this case, uh, the failure to access the proper data and process it well could have cost the Earth. So the movement now is for what's called fair data, data that's findable, where you can find it easily, it's machine readable, you can discover it, accessibility, where you can use not convoluted processes to access that data, but free and commonly available means of doing it, where you can integrate that data with other sources, maybe not sources that you even thought of at first sight, and where you can reusable, uh, re reuse that data um, outside the area from which it was initially suspected it would be used. And that's the central area which is so important in climate change for example, because we now have to integrate multiple data sources uh, to make climate modelling more sophisticated, make it more realistic and give confidence in the outputs. You can see the kind of range of, of open data that's now necessary to drive a global climate model, uh, ranging from uh, land use and, and topography all the way through the atmospheric characteristics and the oceanic characteristics. And that's what's necessary now to get the true picture of where we're going and where we're at. And we now can use that kind of data uh, to make the kind of statements you see at the bottom here, which gives decision makers a much more informed, uh, if you like, field of knowledge for making valuable decisions. Uh, and of course, those decisions we all know now in terms of the IPCC, where a, a lengthy data set, an open data set, gives us the ability to see where we are, gives us the ability to see what's causing the changes that we see uh, today, uh, gives the decision maker no dubiety in terms of causes and therefore necessary actions to be taken. A, a globally uh, dispersed data set as well, tells us where the hotspots are going to be, tells us where we're going to have concerns. For example, as we saw this, uh, this summer in the Mediterranean in terms of drought, tells us where uh, adaptive action is going to be necessary as well, and tells us as well um, how much defence we need, how much action we need to take to adapt to extremes which are going to change radically in terms of their frequency and in terms of their severity. So for example, where we are today, we know that the once in a 50 year event of the past is now a once in a 10 year event in most parts of the world. Uh, we know, for example, that droughts and uh, floods are going to occur with change frequency. And that's something that we have to build in to our defensive actions to our, if you like, the precautionary principle that we have to take to cope with the future in which climate change is throwing at us, all of which requires great data. And that data will tell us as well how near we are to tipping points, to things that we might not easily recover from. For example, the coral reefs will be gone at two degrees of warming. The alpine glaciers have started melting out. We don't know whether they're recoverable. The Arctic sea ice, the Greenland ice even, has started its melt out. 
We don't know what consequences yet all of these will have, but it's important that our data is, if you like, stretched to the limit to enable us to make those decisions in the future. And finally, the, the one point I want to make, which is a great advance that has been made in climate science facilitated by open data, and that is the answer to the perpetual question that we all get asked as, as climate scientists when an extreme event occurs, um, is this caused by climate change? And for many, uh, for most of my career at least, the answer had to be a kind of grey area. We're not sure, uh, we can't attribute an event to climate change, an individual event, but now now we can and we can now through massive amounts of data use and modeling movements that have been very progressive we can now say how much more likely extreme events are and if we take the example of this summer for example for which we're all familiar with for example 40 degrees in the uk uh, 33 in the phoenix park in terms of the uk element of that we can now say to a decision maker it's 10 times more likely than it would have been in the absence of, of human messing around in the atmosphere so all of this has been if you like facilitated by the advance of data, by the advance of uh, open data in many areas. Now, um, I'm going to, to finish just by passing you back uh, to Luke because we're going to see today classic examples of how we can make those kinds of informed decisions better by the use of climate data, by the use of open data and data which is freely available. And this showcase is designed to, to, to show that to you. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you, John. Yes, so as mentioned, we do run an open data portal and we do as far as possible encourage our partners and collaborators to, to publish data as much as possible openly. And, and very often we get that question back. Why wh Why should we publish? What's the value of me publishing this? And uh, it's really um, important for us to have arguments to show, to be able to make the case and to show uh, the relevance of open data. And, and of course, uh, I suppose the, the, the challenge of, of, of climate change is a defining challenge of our era. And if open data can help contribute to addressing that challenge, well then uh, that's uh, surely uh, a, a stronger case as can be made. So many, many thanks, John, for um, joining the dots there for us and helping us to make the case for open data. On that note, I'm going to move on to our um, showcase itself, which is uh, going to show us some great, really, really powerful uses of open data to build tools, applications and dashboards that can have an impact on climate action. So this is the showcase running order, which should be up on your screen here. Our first speaker is Marty and Marty is representing Go Zero Waste app. And Marty is going to tell us all about this app and what they've done. To create solutions to facilitate a life without waste, that's what we want to do. And to do so, we create uh, an application that is called Go Zero Waste App and has a, a, like a feature that is called Moving Towards Zero. That is a campaign that we want to promote actions uh, among citizens to uh, promote at the same time zero waste and local consumption. We want to do with this uh, encourage uh, system habits and it's like a game. So uh, when people overcome this kind of challenge, we show them what is the impact of what they are doing, like the waste and CO2 calculator for each challenge and also has different levels. So you can start with the initial level and do easy, easy challenge. And then each time you overcome um, challenge, you get some points and you get intermediate level and then you can get advanced level. And with these points, you can get some rewards as gift cards to spend in the local shopping. You can get tickets to go to the museums, tickets to go to the movies. So uh, this is the problem we want to address. Uh, when you go buy, uh, you uh, get a lot of waste because a lot of products are wrapped in a single use plastic. And this kind of plastic normally it's not recycled and recycled and it goes to, uh, sorry. Want to go to, it goes to our nature, it goes to our rivers, it goes to our oceans, forests, it pollutes our, our water, so uh, it kills our animals as well. So that's what we want to offer this kind of open and, and collaborative digital tool. So first of all, what we do is uh, we have a map that is a, a worldwide map where you can find a stores that are promoting zero waste and circular economy products and services. So, uh, each time we uh, launch a campaign, what we do first is to uh, fill this map with a lot of stores. Um, all of these stores has to do some practices like uh, buy um, 
uh, bulk, you can uh, bring your compute, uh, containers. So in case of Dublin, what we have done is uh, we have uploaded in this open map 62 stores that are promoting zero waste. 18 users help us uh, suggesting a stores uh, like look I, I know that in my neighborhood this store is promoting zero waste so I'm going to upload it in the map and also we have been using data from go zero waste directory and, and return that is a reusable container service that is working in some restaurants in Dublin and also we have uh, uploaded some fountains because uh, in the Dublin open data source we can we can find these fountains when you want to refill your reusable bottle so this is important. And also in the collaboration with um, South Dublin County Council and Dublin City Council, we have selected uh, 30 challenges uh, to launch in this kind of campaign to all citizens of Dublin. So all these challenges are really easy to overcome, like uh, reuse a, a glass of jar, uh, buy pasta in bulk, um, buy a bamboo toothpaste, um, buy ugly fruit. So uh, normally when we launch this campaign, uh, we get a lot of pictures uh, because when you have to overcome a challenge, you have to send us a picture in order to prove that you have overcome the challenge. So we received some pictures like uh, use a reusable um, bottle, uh, listen to a podcast about zero waste, buy in bulk, um, suggest stores, uh, use a lunchbox each time you go to a restaurant. So that's the, the, the campaign and this is the, the, what we see at the future of moving towards zero is First of all, uh, climate education. There is a lot of people that don't know still what is zero waste and circular economy. We want to promote this kind of waste reduction, waste reduction, connecting with uh, local consumption, and we want to be inclusive. We want to everybody can be part of the, the campaign, not just using our app. We have a, another kind of analogic um, options. So we have we think that uh, if we all be part of the solution, we can change uh, this problem. To this another one because we when we buy uh, without creating any, any kind of waste we are part of the solution. So uh, we have uh, launched this campaign in some um, town councils and, and companies and schools here in Spain. And thanks to our partners, uh, Ellen McCarthy Foundation, uh, Southern Ocean Alliance, Beyond Plastic Med, and uh, we are um, trying to uh, go uh, international and, and launch this kind of campaign everywhere in the world. And for sure, uh, when we have to launch a campaign, it's need to, to, to have some funding to a communication plan, to invest in social media ads, uh, to have a collaboration with influencers and to uh, launch some radio and TV commercials. That's it. We are ready to provide this kind of digital tool to engage with some councils here in Ireland as well. And thanks to gamification and technology, we can help with this. Thank you so much. This is Martin and here you have my contact. Brilliant. Thank you, Marty. M many, many thanks. So uh, Marty's uh, contact details are there and we'll provide contact details for Marty and for all the other presenters, as well as links to their various tools, dashboards and applications. And uh, as Marty mentioned there, through the challenge, they populated the app for Dublin. So you can see lots of z zero waste uh, amenities, shops and, uh, and activities. If you were to download uh, this app today, you could check all that out. And if you are interested in in uh, running any challenges or engaging with this app in order to promote zero waste in your area uh, or your region, whatever it is, I think Marty would be very, very open to um, uh, you getting in touch with him. So brilliant, Marty. Many, many thanks uh, for participating thanks. in this challenge and thanks for your presentation today. Uh, we're going to move on to our next presenter now, who is Luis. Uh, Luis, can you please present on your nature-based solutions zoning map? project. Thank you. So, hello everyone. My name is uh, Luis Silva. I'm a geographer, uh, mostly focused on climate risk assessment. Uh, my partner in this project is Natalia Panis, a social scientist in art and design for the public space researcher. And our project is called Dublin's Demand for Nature-Based Solutions. Next slide, please. Uh, well, nature-based solutions can be defined as actions to protect sustainably managed and restore natural or modify ecosystems, which address societal challenges such as climate change, food and water uh, security, or natural disaster. So nature-based solutions are a way to use nature in our favor, uh, recovering ecosystem services 
and take advantage of its benefits to help us to cope with climate change. So considering it is relevant uh, in facing the climate change challenges, our project uh, investigates um, investigates where nature-based solutions are most needed in Dublin. Uh, and to do so, to the elaboration of a map uh, using a bunch of open data sets, creating a tool to support the decision-making process, showing where and to whom nature-based solutions should be prioritized. Uh, our solutions uh, address the urgency of climate change and the ability of nature-based solutions to respond to them, especially uh, in an environmentally compromised area and amongst uh, the vulnerable. Uh, it's designed to optimize the use of time and resources when planning nature-based solutions. Uh, the first step, the first step was to gather data and information to elaborate six ecosystem service spatial data sets, uh, considering the natural aspects. Three of them are part of the National Ecosystem Service and Ecosystem Service map developed by the National Park and Wildlife Service, available on that uh, data.gov uh, portal. Uh, these trees are the carbon storage, water quality, and food provision. And the other three, uh, we developed ourselves uh, using a, a free software called Invest to generate uh, a pollinator, uh, flood risk mitigation, and a heat mitigation models. Uh, we also used include um, a social deprivation index to ensure that the social aspects would be also considered in this decision making uh, process too. Uh, so the following step was to overlap or to combine all these elements and generate a final map, our tool to support decision. Next slide, please. Uh, this map uh, consists of our final results. The map represents the nature-based solutions demand index in Dublin. The interpretation is pretty straightforward. As you can see, uh, reds for high demands and greens for low demands. Uh, to showcase that, we create a store map where the general public uh, can analyze and interact with the data that is available on smartdublin.ie. Uh, oh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a tool that can help the decision make process. Uh, it can be used for the strategic deployment of nature based solutions, both at the government or uh, private levels. It can also be used by, by locals the general public as a way to contest decisions, demanding improvements, or monitoring uh, the social and environmental conditions of their surroundings. Now, uh, in terms of future perspective, uh, we are planning to launch an online platform to aggregate all spatial data relevant to improve the decision-making process around nature-based solutions uh, and turn that into a real citizen science project. We visualize um, the possibility of producing uh, and, and use existing uh, spatial information in a collaborative way um, and bringing science-based evidence to people to engage with renaturing the city. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, well, we would like to invite everyone uh, to visit our star map web page and interact with our solutions and our results. Uh, and please uh, be free to contact us for any feedback or question that you may have. And that's it. Thanks so much. That's lovely. And thank you, um, Luis. Brilliant. And uh, uh, Luis is contactable uh, by the emails that we'll provide at the end. Uh, he has a public facing story map where you can see uh, which areas uh, can or should be prioritized for nature based solutions. And he's also um, a here and able to answer any of your questions in the Q&A function. So if you have any questions for Luis or for any of the other speakers today, 
do please fire away. I'm going to move straight on to our next speaker because we are pushed for time. And the next project that uh, is coming up is a Dublin cycling prioritization analysis tool. And our speaker for that is Johan. Johan, can you please take the screen control and move on to the next slide? Thank you. Yes. OK, thank you very much. Yes, uh, our project is on um, cycling infrastructure prioritization. Um, before I get started, I'd like to introduce uh, the team. Uh, hopefully it moves to the to the next slide. Uh, my name is Johan. Uh, I'm joined uh, by James, uh, Ruth and Cameron. Uh, we're a collection of data scientists uh, and geospatial analysts. Um, and we work together in our research division in Knight Frank, which is a global property consultant. Uh, I'd like to start by um, just looking at the challenges uh, around climate transport and cycling. Um, you know, we know that the regional councils uh, of Dublin are really keen to push forward this modal shift uh, away from polluting vehicles towards something that is um, healthier, more active and carbon free that cycling can provide. Um, but of course, when it comes to cycling, um, it's no easy ride uh, yet. Um, there are still some key challenges uh, that exist, and these might um, take the form of uh, barriers for adoption. Um, you know, key dissuaders often cited when it comes to um, the uptake of cycling um, are issues around uh, safety, traffic, um, or lack of cycling facilities. Um, we also know that there is inequality um, when it comes to cycling. Not everyone has equal access um, to bikes. Um, and we know that there's actually a, a significant gender divide between male and female cyclists um, as well. Um, and lastly, infrastructure. This is a really big pinch point um, because we have to be able to work with the existing infrastructure that we have. We have to be able to adapt uh, and improve uh, you know, the roads that exist um, for future needs, you know, in this case for um, preparing it for uh, more and more cyclists that may come up in the future. Uh, and that's where our project comes in. So, um, you know, what we hope to achieve is, is to try and address some of these problems. Um, we hope to do that uh, by providing a new uh, and innovative uh, analysis for Dublin that really tries to provide two things. And um, the first being a cycle scheme accessibility uh, assessment. And the second um, is identification of roads and junctions um, that Dublin councils could prioritise for review um, where cycling improvements um, could be made. We've used lots of open data in this project, um, Moby, Bleeper and Dublin bike location data, but we've also drawn data from um, CSO and community driven data from OpenStreetMap as well as Strava Metro data um, too. And of course, what we've been, um, you know, what we try to achieve in this is to feed directly into uh, Dublin's Transport Climate Action Plan that already states two key actions. Um, the first being to expand cycle share schemes in Dublin, uh, and the second is to construct more um, cycleways as well. And of course, the main point behind all of this is to reduce carbon, um, ideally through um, encouraging more cycling um, that could be achieved by making Dublin um, cycling uh, both safer and more accessible. And um, so what were we able to achieve? Um, the first objective was to look at cycle scheme accessibility. Um, what we were able to do was calculate the five minute walking distance um, from every bike location across the city, of which, of course, there are uh, many, many hundred. That's the shaded area you can see there on the map uh, on the screen. Um, but when we when we looked at how the population density um, overlaps with the shaded area, we were able to determine that 15 percent or about 200,000 people um, in Dublin um, fall within five minute walk of a bike hire scheme. Um, but perhaps what this map uh, more importantly um, illustrates um, are those areas that are perhaps lacking easy access to public bikes. And that's particularly obvious as you move further away um, from the city centre. And it's these areas that we would recommend to Dublin to um, review, uh, to look into as they decide to expand cycle schemes and also ways that they could measure um, and track performance and success of these future cycle schemes as well. Uh, the second objective was to look at road and junction prioritisation and the map shown on screen here are a selection of, uh, of road sections um, the red ones in particular that we're recommending to Dublin um, to review for possible cycling uh, infrastructure improvements. And the way we've been able to do this is by looking at 20,000 um, journeys made on Moby and Bleeper bikes across the city. Um, we had to estimate um, the, the, the likely route those cycle journeys um, would have taken and in so doing we were able to account for changes um, in cycling behaviour as well. So perhaps some cyclists like to take the shortest route possible, but maybe others, um, you know, there may be subtle variations between male um, and female cycling routes as well. And what we also did was, a, was uh, to uh, score all the roads in Dublin uh, for cyclability by accounting for changes in road type, uh, road speed and cycle lane provision as well. And, and by accounting for these different um, variables and factors, we were able to uh, surface a selection of roads that we think should be prioritised um, for cycling um, infrastructure improvement. 
uh, we did the same for um, road junctions in Dublin as well. Uh, the way we did this was to look at cycling throughput and the complexity of those junctions and the cycleability of those connecting roads. And again, by, by accounting for these different um, parameters, um, we're able to surface the selection junctions um, shown there on the map um, in the red dots and that we think uh, could use some cycle infrastructure improvements as a priority. Uh, lastly, uh, what does the future hold? Well, I think first of all, um, our, our analysis was uh, very much a proof of concept, but I think we've been able to demonstrate. Um, and with any sort of proof of concept, you know, there's lots that could be improved. And there's a list of things um, that we think the future holds for us. Um, but just to draw out a few uh, specifics, um, we think accounting for things like traffic and road collisions would be really, really interesting uh, and improve our, our scoring algorithm as well. Um, you know, beyond that, we think there's lots of scope to possibly identify um, the optimal areas of where these cycle schemes be expanded into. And of course, this is a, a highly repeatable study based on open data. And that means that we could actually take the same analysis and apply it to different cities uh, across Ireland um, and the UK possibly as well. So lots um, of exciting things for the future. Uh, that's it from me. Um, thank you very much. You can browse the full uh, report online at the link provided. Um, but otherwise, I thank you for your time. Brilliant. And thank you, Johan, for, for sticking to time. That's brilliant. And uh, we can see there a link to the story map. And again, we'll be providing the link to Johan's uh, project output and to all the ones uh, later on today and also by follow up email. So if you have any questions for Johan, do please put them into the Q&A again with the others and we'll move on to our next project. Thanks again, Johan. The next one is the I Adapt game. Uh, which is a climate adaptation game and uh, Professor Anna Davis is going to present on this today. Anna. Good afternoon everyone, it's great to be here. Um, my name is Anna Davis and I'm Professor of Geography at Trinity College Dublin. I'm the PI of the Climate Smart Project which developed the iADAPT game. And the Climate Smart Project is funded by Science Foundation Ireland through the Enable Spoke, and it's focusing on creating accessible and engaging resources to support public participation in planning for climate change adaptation. The iADAPT game was designed and developed by myself and Stefan Hugel as the capstone element of the Climate Smart Educational Resource Platform. Over the summer, we've been working to incorporate additional data from Dublin City Council into the game as part of the Open Data Challenge. Adapting to inevitable climate change is essential, but here in Ireland planning is in its infancy. The iADAPT Serious Game for Climate Change Adaptation, uh, co-designed by students, teachers, gamers, societies, scientists and policy experts. It's the year 2045 and you're the newly elected mayor of Dublin. The city is at higher risk of flooding than ever before because of climate change. Your task is to address these risks and protect the city. and its citizens by 2050. Each year, you must create, consult on and implement a climate adaptation plan. Select from a range of flood defences, nature-based solutions, policies and public engagement strategies to build your plan. Use the interactive map to explore where your defences are located. You can zoom, pan or tilt the map. Are you protecting all your citizens equally? You have a limited budget, so choose wisely. And remember, not everyone will be in favour of your changes. Make too many unpopular choices and you will get kicked out of office. But don't worry, in each round you'll receive expert feedback to guide you and get a chance to revise your plan. What you can't predict is the size and nature of the annual flood event. You have five years to defend the city. Will you be climate smart? Good luck. So iADAPT already included open scientific data predicting the scale and scope of flooding from climate change. Our open data challenge was to enrich the game experience by adding in live open sensor data from Dublin City Council's rainfall and river water level sensors. These sensors are used for the monitoring, prediction and modelling of weather events in Ireland. This involved technical coding work to ensure the sensors appeared on the interactive map as animated markers. In the iADAPT game, the sensors are marked on the map by clickable dots, Clicking on these provides additional information to players. So if it's raining, that will be shown on the marker where you click it. The use of live open data from Dublin City Council allows players to experience this for themselves when they play the game. The real time data brings the place based nature of the iADAPT game to life, adding a greater level of interactivity. The availability of this data demonstrates Dublin City Council's commitment to climate action. So we are rolling out the Climate Smart Workshops and iADAPT game across Dublin for the rest of this year, and we'll be supporting more than 2,000 sessions with around 400 students in 14 schools across Dublin. 
And if we're successful in our application for further funding, we aim to roll out Climate Smart and the IADAP game nationwide in 2023. We're also working on a plan to create a Climate Smart Cork version of the IADAP game. But ultimately, our goal is to provide accessible educational materials on adapting to climate change for everyone. And we look forward to integrating more open data into the game as they become available, supporting everyone to become climate smart. Thank you. And thank you, Anna. Brilliant. Thanks for the presentation and thanks for your participation in the challenges. Anna explained uh, some projects built their solutions from scratch and others were further expanded, built on, developed. And uh, this is one example of those. So, so well done uh, for your participation and uh, everybody do please look that up. If you have any questions or want to engage with the um, game further, uh, do please get into contact with um, uh, Anna and Stefan there. We all will, as I say, share contact details for everybody. But moving swiftly on, our next presenter is Alana Boyle and she's going to present on an invasive species dashboard. So over to you, Alana. Perfect. So the title of our project is the data, data visualization of the distribution of invasive flora species and their proximity to native woodlands. So about us. So myself and my colleague Dean, who unfortunately cannot be here today, both have a keen interest in biodiversity and we both joined the DXC Data Analytics and Consulting Graduate Programme in September of 2021. So first of all, I'll give you some background into our project. The spread of invasive flora species is a massive threat to our native woodlands. We became interested in trying to get a clear picture of the distribution of invasives and their distance to native woodlands. Native woodlands contain native trees, contain native tree species and they are also biodiverse havens. They support many species such as fungi, birds, invertebrate, etc. These woodlands also have significant cultural value. Climate change is inter intertwined with the loss of biodiversity. Biodiversity and ecosystems supply essential services such as oxygen, pollination of plants, pest control and many more. So the problem. Our problem, the problem that we chose to investigate was that Native woodlands are under threat from many factors. As previously mentioned, we focused on the threat of invasive species. This impact could lead to the loss of natural woodlands in Ireland and as a result could greatly impact climate change. In our research, we discovered that there was a distinct lack of data surrounding the distribution of invasive species in relation to native woodlands. This inspired us to undertake this as part of the competition. So our dashboard integrates open data directly into the map. We've integrated a colour scheme to highlight the difference between different species and also to highlight the aerial distribution of the native woodlands. The dashboard's primary goal is to serve as an educational tool. The purpose is educational as well as providing the ability to monitor, benchmark and track the impact of invasive species. So I'll now just give you a quick demo of our dashboard. So unfortunately, we couldn't get our dashboard live in time due to some technical difficulties, but hopefully it will be made public facing very shortly. So this is our title page. And as you can see on the left hand side, we have the species that are within two kilometers of a native woodland. We have a list displaying all the species and their distance and the same on the right. And that is species within five kilometers. And as you can see in both, rhododendron is by far the most the species that is closest and causing the most threat. And then we also have a quick description of our dashboard. So moving on then, we have an interactive map and this is illustrating the distribution of invasive species. So the map is highly interactive in which you can search for features and it'll bring you right the way in. Here we've zoomed into Tralee and you can see the native woodlands as well as sycamore maple, red oyster dogwood, common snowberry and cherry laurel. You can search to anywhere in particular. So even if we take Dublin here as well, for example, again, it will bring you right the way in and you can see all of the invasive species that are present up in swords. So you can also zoom in and out manually if you didn't want to, if you didn't want to search or type. And then moving on, we have a second interactive map. And again, it's exactly the same as the first one in the sense that you can search and type in. So we here we have a heat map displaying the distribution of woodlands, starting with the dark blue color. This is the least dense amount of wood and going all the way up to the red, which has the most amount of wood. Now moving on, here we have some graphs. 
So we have the count of invasive species by county. So this is the top 10. And then we have the count of woodland type in Ireland. And then down at the bottom, we have woodland area by hectare done by county. And we also have drop down menus. So if the county you're looking for isn't listed in the top 10, you can just use the drop down features and it will show you the county you're looking for. And it's the same for the graph on the bottom with the woodland area by hectare. So then we've included a Q&A feature. So for example, if we take this suggested one here, how many cherry laurels are in Cork? It'll bring you up the exact count and you can ask it a wide multitude of questions. And then moving on to the last page, here we just have some fun facts. There's about three to four fun facts per species that we chose to investigate. As just shown, we were able to produce a dashboard that highlights the proximity of invasive forest species. So post challenge. If we're able to continue with the dashboard, we will try to gain access to further restricted data, which may include more interesting metrics. We could also potentially get updated data from groundwork checks that are currently happening. We're going to move straight on to our next project now, which is my remote working hub. And Ali Riza Delgani, Professor Ali Riza Delgani is going to present on that. Ali Riza, thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ali Reza Dehgani, and I'm going to talk about our project today. So, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for providing me this opportunity to talk about the problem. Actually, so we are facing with the problem, almost all of us, we are facing with that problem, working from there. And also I want to talk about that to see how we can actually create a value on that in terms of the climate action. So, uh, if you are told in 2015 that a virus can, can, will come up in 2022 and will change the life of all of us, you would say no way. What it happened, and what happened because of that? Because of that, uh, it has changed a lot of things. I mean, we couldn't work from the our uh, workplace. We should work from home. And afterward, after the COVID, the problem was actually it was really hard to get back get back to the office and from the other hand it was really hard to work from home so what was the solution actually remote working hubs got really important so in this project we started thinking how we can optimize create the awareness and also create some sort of the climate action in terms of remote working hubs so we went through different uh, stakeholders to see what kind of the value proposition we can create for. Finally, the end, we got to the end users. Actually, we started thinking of how we can suggest them the best remote working hub based on their custom criteria and also how we can increase the awareness of remote working hubs. Probably not everyone is using that. And also we wanted to create some sort of the insight for decision makers in terms of the performance of existing remote working hubs and also helping uh, new founders of remote working hub to know where they can find their business, etc. So accordingly, three uh, our value proposition are threefolded. That's the awareness. We want to increase the awareness. We want to leverage AI to help the end user find their best place and increase the awareness. We want to help to uh, in terms of rural and urban planning by extending the number of remote working hubs, and also we want to create action for the climate in terms of reducing the carbon footprint and creating sustainable climate action in line there. So the best idea to do that was to create an app. This app, which is called My R Remote Working Hub, RWH, helps you to explore all this information and get to the data. It is like that, the whole app, as you can see. The best idea probably is to show you our website. So if you go to the website, if you try click on Try Demo, you will get to in here. You would be able to see all the remote working hubs in Ireland in purple icons like this and then you can actually select the time for example like this and like let's say the location uh, the type of your travel location and if you search you would be able to see the region around yourself with that distance and that mode of travel and all the remote work you have inside all the amenities there you can switch them on and off and you would be able the list of all remote working hubs so you can pick which one do you want to go if you click on one of them you would be able to see uh, actually uh, that a specific remote working hub and your cell in the center all the information what facility it has if you want to see what location what is your route from your home to that remote working hub etc and also carbon calculator which shows you if you travel five days per week how much kilocalorie you are 
uh, consuming burning and if for example you go for car instead you would be able to see how much would be your carbon footprint per year if you play with the uh, AI behind the, the application. If you click on, for example, bicycle parking and you show it is more important for me, application starts suggesting other areas above the selected area you want. If you say uh, car sharing is important for me, very important, so it will change the criteria. If you say charging station is important, so it will change the thing for you. You say less important and so on. So you can play with that. See, these guys are the suggested item by the AI and these guys are the other areas inside the, uh, your environment and so on. In the future, we want to improve, to improve it and create some sort of user areas. You can record all your travels across the days, weeks, months and so on. You can, um, you can measure your carbon footprint and we can provide you some vouchers if you help in terms of saving the carbon footprints. So if you come back to the slides, for the future, we want to release the app, provide people to use it and measure the carbon footprints on the data. This information will help us to create insight for the decision makers. We are hardly working on improving the performance of AI engine based on the scientific approaches we have, based on the data we get, and also we are developing a comprehensive and uh, versatile carbon footprint calculator to consider a lot of more factors, right? So. That's the team we have built, myself, my friend, and so on. And finally, that's the contact information. If you want to reach out, that's the website and that's the email address. You can send me an email and get in contact for the information. Yeah. Thank you, Alimi. So that's great. And as, it, um, as was mentioned, some of these have been built from scratch and some of these are developed. And just to say, this was fully created from scratch uh, within the, the short time frame of the challenge. So, so quite an achievement there. And it's a tool both for optimizing where to locate um, lo remote working hubs and also to optimize use of them. So it's for the users as well as the, I suppose, the policy makers and decision makers. So that's great. Thank you very much, Ali Ree. So moving on to our next project, we have Diana Carter uh, here presenting on the Dublin Carbon Calculator. Hello, I'm Finian Quinn, Net Zero Lead for Blue Wave Technology. We're excited to share our Dublin Carbon Calculator with you. It is a joint project between Salesforce, a global leader in cloud-based technologies, and Blue Wave Technology, a Platinum Salesforce Solutions partner. Our team is made up of Aya Srivastava, a Blue Wave a Tableau scientist, myself, Finian Quinn from Blue Wave, Diana Carter, Solution Engineer for Public Sector for Salesforce, JP King, a solution engineer for Tableau, and John Stobie, or VP for Public Sector Ireland for Salesforce. Diana, over to you. First, a bit of context. Ireland is committed to a 51% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030 relative to 2018 levels. But the Environmental Protection Agency warns that the National Climate Action Plan needs to be implemented faster if that goal is to be met. Analysis from Kadima, Dublin's energy agency, shows that over half of Dublin's energy-related emissions comes from residential and transport, and almost two-thirds of transport emissions are generated by private vehicles. All this means that individual citizens have a critical role to play in helping meet Ireland's climate goals. This is why we've created the Dublin Carbon Calculator, a communications tool designed to help citizens understand the impact they can have and motivate them to take action quickly. It leverages Kadima's open data sets on Dublin's carbon emissions and couples this with postcode and small area code data. Our project team has estimated the impact of carbon reducing measures, such as installing a heat pump, and compares this to the EPA's open data on future emissions as a benchmark. Drawing on insights from the SCAI's behavioral research papers, we use a narrative infographic to tell a story around the data in particular, to generate personalised takeaway quotes that users can internalise and socialise with family, friends and colleagues. Ultimately, we want everyone to feel that we're in this together and we've all got an important part to play in shaping our path to 2030. It can be pretty overwhelming to hear endless bad news stories about the climate, especially if you think you can't really have any impact. We aim to overcome this by highlighting a clear, simple goal and putting this in a local context, so an individual user can find out how much carbon do we need to save in my local area by 2030. We then allow users to explore the potential impact if each year 
more and more Dublin households adopt a specific measure like installing insulation. And finally, practical actions, big and small, so that everyone can start by doing something. I will now show you the carbon calculator in action. Thanks, Anna and Finian. Now, let me give you a quick demo for the Dublin Carbon Calculator, a project developed for the 2022 Open Data Climate Action Challenge. Ireland has committed to reducing carbon emission by 51% by 2030. But to achieve this, we need to significantly speed up implementation of the National Climate Action Plan. Over half of Dublin's energy-related emission, 57%, come from residential and transport emission. This means that individual citizens have a big role to play in helping meet Ireland's sustainability target. Now, let's take a closer look at the map section of our calculator. It helps you as a citizen answer a simple question. How much carbon do we need to reduce in my area to meet the 2030 goal? You can view the data for all of Dublin or filter it by your local authority, your postcode, and even hover over the map to understand your small area code and the tons of carbon emission that happened in 2021. When you hover over the map, it also tells you the amount of carbon emission that you want to reduce by 2030 and also the equivalence of removing the emission from the households and taking off the number of cars off the road. To understand more about the calculation and the map, you can just click on the info bubbles and you will be directed to a link where you can get the calculation understanding. Moving on, now we got the idea of what we need to achieve. Let's take a look how we can do it. We can see in the right hand side of the map, if we pick an energy saving measure here, heat pump plus insulation, we can reduce the emission by 16%, which is about 34% of the 2030 tar target. We can also see how this contributes to the EPA's estimated residential emission trend if ambitious climate plan is implemented. Now that you got the sense of the impact you can make, what can you actually do today? Here are some concrete answers, from small steps to bigger projects. You can do a home energy audit with Kadima's energy saving kit, check out Dublin bike scheme near you, explore the Go Zero Waste app to find local shop that encourages reusable packaging and more. You can also nurture biodiversity in your own window box or garden. If we all do what we can, as soon as we can, we will be well on the road of meeting our 2030 goals. We would like to thank the four Dublin councils, Smart Dublin, and all the partners for organizing the Open Data Climate Action Challenge. We would also like to thank the team from Northumberland County Council, who inspired us with their own carbon calculator published on Tableau Public. You can find the Dublin Carbon Calculator on Tableau Public or via the link sfdc.co slash Dublin Carbon Calculator. Together we can chart the path to a greener, more sustainable 2030. Thank you. Over to you, Finian. So thanks, Ayush. Thanks, Diana. Our aim over the coming months is to engage with more local authorities and public bodies around Dublin and Ireland to understand how they could potentially use the model we have built to share data and drive behavioural change in their areas. For anyone that would like to discuss that with us, please get in touch. We would be delighted to speak with you. That's lovely. So thank you, Finian, uh, Diana and Ayush. Um, very, very quickly, we have two um, uh, people to speak. Just um, Helena will mention the National Open Data Programme, and they generously provided us with funding for this through the Open Data Engagement Fund, and that fund is now live. So, um, um, Helena, would you like to speak very briefly about the National Open Data Programme? Great, that's fantastic. Very quickly, um, I'd just like to say hello. It's great to be here and to see the very impressive projects on climate action. My slide is showing just a small sample of how open data already features in all our lives. Our work in the Open Data Unit covers a wide remit. We work to improve data maturity across the public service. We cooperate and benchmark with our European counterparts. We promote open data training, education and use. And we assess the impact that open data has um, on the public service, but also on, on, for the public in general. 
We support public sector compliance with the EU Open Data Directive, and we are currently in the process of developing the second national open data strategy. The Open Data Engagement Fund, which is one of the sponsors of this challenge, was established in 2015. It funds small scale projects that use open data and, and there's up to 5,000 euros available per project. I'm always keen to see how, how open data is used in practice and to promote its reuse as much as possible, especially through this engagement fund. This year's fund was launched last week by our minister and the closing date is the 27th of October. Uh, more information of that on that is available on our portal data.gov.ie. We typically fund activities like this climate event, um, but also those promoting environmental awareness, education, hackathons, heritage projects, um, all through the medium of open data. And with that, I'll leave you to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. And our next speaker is Dave Dodd, who's going to speak to us about uh, the climate action plans of the local authorities and the Climate Action Regional Office. Dave, over to you. Thank you. Thanks and good afternoon all. I'm mindful we're eating into lunch here, so I'll try to be very quick. Firstly, just thanks to Smart Dublin uh, on behalf of all the partners involved. It's been a really exciting process to be involved in over the last number of months and to Luke in particular has put a lot of time into it. Uh, and thanks to all the attendees and the project participants. Uh, I was a mentor for one of the projects and it was a really uh, interesting process to be involved in. So I'm the coordinator of the Dublin Climate Action Regional Office. For those of you who haven't heard of us, we're called the CAROs. We are funded by the Department of Environment, uh, Communications and Climate Action to work directly with the local authority sector uh, on climate action. And Maynard, if you wouldn't mind just advancing the slides there, please, to work through them. Um, I'm the coordinator for the Dublin Metropolitan Region, which works with the four Dublin local authorities under climate change action plans. And next slide, please. Just in terms of context, you've, you've heard from a lot of really interesting projects, a lot of them with direct applicability. I suppose you're asking where can these fit? Um, and I suppose you've heard from Professor John Sweeney at the very outset, who's been involved at the highest levels in terms of informing IPCC um, assessment reports. And I suppose all of that scientific input and all of that uh, global, international, European policy feeds down into national policy, sectoral adaptation plans, and by, by no means last or least but local authority climate change adaptation and action plans and the climate change act that was enacted last july now requires all local authorities to prepare climate action plans uh, and that uh, process has already commenced across the local authority sector uh, next slide please the local authorities are very much at the, the front line of climate action whether that be in terms of their uh, emergency response functions in terms of extreme events, but also in terms of the roles as, as planning, as regulators, in terms of uh, transport infrastructure, the buildings, etc., that are built across the area and parks, etc. Um, and the four Dublins have climate change action plans, and be, these have been developed very much with the staff of the local authorities and very much driven by uh, CODEMA, the Dublin Energy Agency, in conjunction with the CARO. And these particular plans here are all available. There's over 500 actions across the four plans, and they're available at Dublin Climate climate change uh, uh, there is one plan for each area and if you go to also climate Ireland you can see any of the local authority climate ch change plans uh, from around the country and next slide please Maynard and they focus on five key areas and, and all of, indeed all of the projects uh, that you've heard from today fit into these areas so energy and buildings transport flood resilience nature-based solutions and resource management and for the eagle eyes and once you you will notice that some of these targets are now out of date because we had 40 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that's now been increased in line with the the government's ambition but mindful that these plans were published in 2019 and um, 33 percent in energy efficiency and to make dublin a climate resilient region actively engage and inform citizens on climate change. And I think very much that's where open data and climate action, open data in particular sits in terms of informing our citizens and helping to implement these climate change plans at the local level. So that's the last slide. This showcase is one of many events as part of Dublin Climate Action Week. Um, you can check out our webpage. Next slide, sorry Maynard, just for a link to the webpage. There's lots of events on uh, during the week. You can also follow uh, progress on events on, on Twitter using the hashtag DCAW22. Thank you very much. Good luck to all the project par participants and thank you.
Brilliant. And thank you, David. Thank you for your support right through the challenge and thank you for presenting today. Um, brilliant. So there were seven powerful projects and we've heard about them all from waste minimization to nature based solutions to active travel to adapting to climate change in dealing with invasive species promoting remote working hubs and developing some kind of interactive infographics to really show us where we are and where we can get to and what we need to do. So they're all really, really varied, really, really powerful and impactful projects that really have showcased open data and how it can be used in the real world to affect real change. So brilliant, well done to all. However, we do have three prize winners that we uh, need to give prizes to. We have collected together this uh, prize fund after all, so we'll have to give it to somebody. Uh, if you'd like to move on to the next slide now, I'd like to just announce who they are. So congratulations, big congratulations to the I Adapt game for winning third prize. Well done. Anna, you have uh, 30 seconds if you'd like to say any words. Thanks so much. Yeah, no, we're delighted. Um, please do get in touch if you'd like to know anything more about the Climate Smart game or the, or the iADAPT game. We're, we're very interested in anybody, any schools or youth groups or anybody who would be interested to play. So thanks so much. Brilliant. Congratulations again, Anna. Well done. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Second prize is to be awarded to the, 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 the drum roll. The Dublin Cycling Prioritisation Analysis Tool. Well done, Johan and team. Congratulations. Uh, do you have a few set of words that you'd like to say? Uh, thank you very much, Luke. Uh, that's a really, really big surprise. Really delighted to be winning that. Um, I was just sitting with the other team in the other room. Uh, I'm sure they're delighted as well. So thanks to them um, as well. Brilliant, well done. And as with the other projects, this is a public facing tool, so anybody can look it up and interact with it and see uh, where, where, how well they're served by cycling infrastructure or, or where there might be a need for it. And now, without further ado, we'll move on to the first prize winner. Who could it be? Let's see, next slide, please. My Remote Working Hub. Ali Reza, please, can you take the screen and uh, give us a couple of words? Congratulations. Oh my God, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm really, really delighted. I know my team also, they are. That was really an interesting journey. We tried to create a value. Really appreciate all the support. Please get in touch to develop this beautiful application and help people actually to help actually climate action. Thank you. Thank you again. Brilliant. And thank you, Ali Reza. And thank you to everybody who took part. As I said, seven really, really powerful projects that really, really do sh showcase open data very well and provide a basis for uh, interventions which support climate action. So what's next? Uh, absolutely, all of those um, uh, projects showcase a very up for and um, willing and um, outward facing and want interaction with you. They want to develop their projects still further. They want to see them implemented. They want to see them um, take effect. So do please engage with them. As I said, we'll share contact details as well as links to all the public facing um, uh, applications, tools and uh, dashboards. We have a blog on this and we'll update this to, to take account of what's uh, happened here today. Uh, there's a couple of links there for the open data sites, the national and our Dublin region one. And we're going to do more of these challenges in future. So do please uh, stay in tune with us. We have a newsletter that you can sign up to and uh, do please engage with us as we are uh, work through open data in developing it, uh, promoting it uh, and making better use of it. So last slide is just a list of everybody who presented today and their contact details. As I say, we'll send it on to you again. Many thanks to everybody who's taken a part. Uh, apologies that we went a little over time. We did have a few technical issues to contend with, uh, but I think we'll iron them out in time before we get the, um, the recordings out. So thanks again to all the participants, all my co-organizers and everybody that's uh, 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 contribute in some way, shape or form to this. Thanks again and good afternoon.